If you were forced to play a real-life game of werewolf to save a little girl from violent psychopaths, what would you do? A blizzard left us stranded in the mountains alongside four complete strangers, and at least one of them has a dark secret bound and gagged in the back of their van. With no way out until morning and no cell service to call for backup, we'll have to take matters into our own hands before Kiddo winds up on a milk carton. I'm gonna break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the kidnappers in No Exit. Darby's at the end of her rope. It's day 11 of her seventh attempt at rehab, and she'll be the first to admit it's not going great. But things are about to get a whole lot worse. An urgent phone call pulls her out of the group share with grim news. Her mother's been hospitalized with a brain aneurysm and is about to undergo surgery two states away. What's more, house rules dictate she can't even make so much as a phone call without authorization from her doctor. And given it's Friday afternoon, he's probably already three martinis into the weekend by now. Later that night, Darby strong-arms a secret cell phone off one of her fellow patients and calls her sister to ask for help in getting out. Only, it seems that bridge got nuked from orbit a long time ago. No one has time for your bullshit right now. Don't call me back. How touching. However, a little tongue lashing from her estranged sibling isn't enough to keep Darby away. After carting her way into a utility closet and arming up with a few tools of her former trade, she makes a mad dash for a nearby fire door before heading out to the parking lot and saw blading into an orderly's firebird. The keys are nowhere to be found because apparently Mikey's not stupid enough to leave them lying under the visor like someone who wants his car to get stolen. Although, he did leave something here. Looks like he takes his work home with him. Give and we're breaking out of rehab, we might want to ditch that bag in case the temptation is too great for us to resist. We're already going to be driving a stolen car, so the last thing we want to do is take anything that'll impair our ability to keep it between the mustard and the mayonnaise. Also, I get this is a beggar's chooser situation, but a gas-guzzling Trans Am is far from the ideal vehicle for making a 649-mile drive from Sacramento, California to Salt Lake City, Utah. I can't imagine Darby's got all that much for gas money right right now. But even if she does, a short range car like that will require several stops for fuel along the way, which only increases the likelihood of us getting spotted by the cops once word gets out about our escape. There seems to be a few other older vehicles in the parking lot she might be able to slim jim that would probably do a bit better on gas. You know, like that wagey special parked right next to her. Darby hammers her way through the ignition and tears off into the night. However, before long the weather takes a turn for the worse, and she soon finds herself driving through several inches of snow. Yet another reason, we should have tried our luck with something else. An old rear-wheel drive muscle car is quite possibly the worst thing imaginable for driving through snow. Unless years of living the high life fried away our knowledge of geography, we should have known to expect these road conditions while heading through the mountains, especially this time of year. If we lose control of the vehicle and plow into a ditch somewhere, it's game over for our little joyride, and maybe even our life if help doesn't show up in time. The love notes from Darby's sister start piling up, prompting her to pull over and reevaluate her decision. Evidently, having dosed off at some point, she's suddenly awakened by a state trooper knocking on her window. He informs her that the road ahead is closed due to the blizzard, meaning she only has two choices. You need their head back down where I opened up the visitor center for some folks. It's a few hundred yards up the road. It's a good thing he didn't see the screwdriver sticking out of the steering column, or we'd be face down in the snow. This also serves as an indication that neither reports of our escape nor the stolen vehicle have made it out this far, and he clearly didn't bother running our plates. With nothing waiting for her back in Sacktown besides a jail cell, Darby opts for door number two and makes her way to the nearby visitor center where she finds three other vehicles parked out front. Inside are four fellow travelers, husband and wife, Ed and Sandy, stringy-haired weirdo Law and heavy sleeper Ash. After settling in for a long night without Wi-Fi, Darby overhears Ed mention to his wife that he managed to get a little bit of cell service out in the parking lot, inspiring her to head back out into the blizzard to hunt for a signal. Not sure why you'd be so concerned about reaching the outside world right now. The only person that even knows you have this phone number isn't exactly thrilled to be talking to you, and based off your previous conversation, I highly doubt she's going to have a change of heart anytime soon. You're just wasting the limited battery you'll need to navigate your way to SLC once the storm breaks. Better to just curl up in a dark corner and wait things out away from the others so no one recognizes your face once this is all over. While poking around the parking lot in search of reception, a strange noise from one of the vehicles catches Darby's attention. Further investigation leads her to a nearby camper van, because of course it does. And you'll never guess what she finds tied up in the back. <laughs> 
well, huh. that figures. There's only two kinds of people that would drive around in something like this, and they both abduct children in their spare time, desperate to rescue the little girl. Darby tries all the doors on the van, but wouldn't you know it, they're all locked up tight. Damn, it's like whoever did this doesn't want her getting away or something. Fortunately, reason momentarily prevails long enough for her to realize she can snap a picture of the van's license plate using the stolen smartphone. Just then, she notices someone seemingly watching her from back inside the lodge, forcing her to leave the child to avoid getting made. The good news is that if Kiddo's captor wanted her dead, she'd most likely be face down in tarp somewhere by now. A snowstorm like this would make an excellent cover for murder, considering the cold temperatures would slow the body's rate of decay and make it more difficult for investigators to determine the exact time of death, as well as covering up evidence and delaying the authorities' response time. My guess is that this is a ransom job, meaning they have a direct interest in keeping her alive long enough to collect, and since no one's going anywhere until the storm passes, this gives us plenty of time to figure out how to help her. I know this isn't very Liam Neeson of me, but now that we have the license plate and a description of the vehicle, we should take a step back from the situation and do whatever we can to get this information over to the cops once we get out of here. After all, there's no telling who and how many of our new friends are in on the kidnapping, or whether they might be armed. If they catch us snooping around the van, we may very well end up inside it, and that's if we're lucky. Although, given we're not exactly on the best terms with our family right now, we'd probably still wind up getting Marvin after they refused to cough up a ransom, thinking it was part of some elaborate scam to score some drugs money. As Darby finds out, there's still not enough cell reception to call 911, but we still might be able to get a simple text message out. Since 2014, more than a thousand law enforcement agencies across the U.S. have been set up to receive emergency texts, so there's a good chance we'll be able to get one through. That said, having the cops roll in to force a confrontation while we're still here is not a good idea. Backed into a corner, the mystery kidnappers might very well take us hostage in a last-ditch attempt to evade capture. Not to mention the fact that we're operating a stolen vehicle while fleeing our court-mandated rehab program. Wouldn't be a good look. Unable to call for help, Darby heads back inside the visitor's center, only to immediately realize she has no idea who might be responsible for the kidnapping. Although, come on, you know Lars has got to have something to do with it. Seriously, dude's got part-time magician written all over him. One thing's for sure, I'm not going anywhere near that coffee pot, just in case whoever's responsible happens to be a Tarantino fan. With nothing better to do, Ed and Sandy invite everyone over to play cards while they wait for things to clear up. Cause why bother getting some sleep to ensure you're not dog ass tired driving to slush tomorrow morning? The gang settles in for a game of BS at Lars's request, which Darby uses as an opportunity to try and sniff out the kidnapper. In doing so, she learns Lars is headed back to his hometown of Battle Mountain, Nevada. And since everyone else claims to be from California, it would seem the van and its Nevada plates could only belong to him. And if that wasn't proof enough, this guy's the psycho. Just wait until you see how he handles losing at his own game. Screwed in your own game. That's a bad beat. Surely, such a well-adjusted human being would never dream of hurting an innocent child. If he's really the kidnapper, he'd have to be pretty stupid to tell a bunch of random strangers where he's actually headed. Although, there's clearly something wrong with the guy. Of course, any of the others could easily be lying about their origins, and unless we've already checked the other two cars out there, who's to say they don't all have Nevada plates? Short of straight up asking who owns the van, we could take advantage of the recent van life craze sweeping the nation to start gushing over over how jealous we are of the owner and see who pipes up. However, given the seriousness of the situation, showing any amount of interest in the van could be bad for our health if they think we might be onto them. With her suspicions all but entirely confirmed, Darby heads to the unfinished women's restroom to send a picture of the van's plates to law enforcement, but the message fails to go through. Gee, I wonder if it has anything to do with that huge ass attachment you're trying to shove through with less than a single bar. I know a picture says a thousand words, but right now you only need 10. Child abduction, young girl, crappy blue van, Nevada plates, 589 MLE. That said, I still don't think calling the cops while we're stuck here is a good idea, so our hero's tech illiteracy might actually work in our favor here. Darby discovers a gaping hole in the exterior wall behind a couple sheets of OSB. After arming up with a box cutter, she heads back to the van and slim jims her way through the passenger side door. However, before she can cut the girl loose and make a break for it, none other than Lars hops into the driver's seat to throw himself a little pity party. You're lucky you're out here, Jay. 
That place is full of liars and cheats. Oh yeah, nothing says luck quite like freezing to death in the back of a kidnapper's van. Hey Darby, now's when you take that box cutter and slash this weirdo's throat while he's sitting helpless in the front seat. Nah, I'm sure you're bound to get plenty more opportunities like this in the near future. Besides, it's not like he might actually spot the human-sized lump wriggling around under the blanket. Suddenly, Lars notices the cardboard covering the back window came loose, revealing the Glock handgun he has tucked away in the felony carry position as he leans back to fix it. Boy, that's a pretty reckless way of carrying a firearm. Sure would be a shame if some unseen actor were to carefully reach into your waistband and squeeze the trigger a few times. Then again, there's no way for us to tell whether it's even got a round in battery. So a much better move in this case would be to swipe his piece while wrenching the box cutter ear to ear. We can screw around with a pistol once the gurgling stops in case he has any accomplices. Lars heads back inside to grab his prisoner something to eat, giving Darby an opportunity to politely introduce herself to the young girl and instead of, I don't know, ripping off the duct tape and asking her who's all involved. Seriously, now's your chance to answer that question definitively, instead of spending all night playing Clue. We can always put the tape back once we're done, to keep Lars none the wiser. But if you're that worried about ripping your lips off, we can at least have her show us on the free hands how many bad guys we're dealing with. She can even nod yes or no as to whether she recognizes any of their names. Oh well, might as well pick away our best chance at learning what we're up against and head back to the bathroom to make sure this whole exercise was as meaningless as possible. We already knew there was a kid in the van. Learning her name doesn't really help us in any way, and we could have just as easily figured out to Lars own the van by staying seated at the card table with everyone else. Party in the van? Alright, I get she couldn't have known that was going to happen, but there was no good reason for her to leave the room in the first place. Sure, she might have been able to get Jay into the Trans Am without anyone noticing, but where's she gonna go from there? By now, they're pretty much completely snowed in, so unless Darby was planning to fast travel out of there, she'd just be taking her out of the ice tray and into the freezer. Besides, eventually Lars was bound to come out and turn the heat on in the van to keep her from freezing to death, and when he noticed the girl disappeared right around the time Darby went to the bathroom, he'd probably put two and two together pretty quick. If we were dead set on doing something more proactive than just committing everything to memory and sending the cavalry in the morning, a much better idea would have been to surreptitiously slash the tires on the van to keep Lars from making a quick getaway once the roads cleared up. We just want to make sure to get the hell out of there as soon as possible in case the blame game got heated. A few minutes later, Lars returns to the van with the promised snacks, this time coming around the passenger side where he notices a set of fresh tracks leading off into the woods. Huh? Whose footprints are these? Hmm, I wonder who could have left those. Meanwhile, Darby re-enters the ladies' room just as Ash comes to check on her, and despite knowing all about the guy, she decides to fill him in on the kidnapping situation. However, before she can share her findings with the complete stranger of unknown motivation, Lars comes barging in after him, only to be immediately sent packing with a little fake makeout action. With that out of the way, Darby brings Ash up to speed on what she's pieced together. Given they're all totally stranded out of here with no way for Lars to escape, he suggests they just sit tight until morning and call the cops as soon as they have cell service. Man, that sounds so familiar. Unfortunately, there's a complication that apparently moves up the timetable. According to Darby, the girl was wearing a wristband, indicating she has some sort of chronic illness. And even though that could be literally anything, she decides this means they have to act quickly to keep her from dying. Yeah, never mind the fact that she'd still be hours away from help if her little mystery condition decided to flare up. She goes on to say that she thinks Lars is onto her, which is why he came into the women's restroom. Being the brave and chivalrous man that he is, Ash suggests Darby exit through the front door to lure the armed criminal outside so he can let Ed and Sandy know what's going on. As for the obvious disparity in firepower, he claims he can rig up a nail gun to fire like a real gun. Yeah, except for the whole being able to kill people part, as it pretty much hit like a BB gun. Seriously, just because you've seen one knockover beer cans at the job site doesn't mean it'll do more than piss this guy off. Better go for the eyes if you're gonna do it. Awful weapons aside, there's a major problem with this plan, and that we have absolutely no way of knowing whether Lars is working alone. Sure, Ed and Sandy might look like a nice old couple out for a road trip, but such a non-threatening appearance would also make them the perfect traffickers for sensitive cargo. Besides, something about their story just doesn't add up. Sandy here surprised me with a little vacation to my favorite city. 
See what I mean? Reno isn't anyone's favorite city, much less a city worth getting stranded out in the middle of nowhere. And even if they are telling the truth, we have no idea how they might react to this information. They could very well start a fight they can't finish and get us all shot. And the same goes for Ash. What, we're just supposed to trust this guy because he's handsome? Sure, when has that ever led anyone to an early grave? Think about it for a second. If seeing the two of you together was all it took to send Lars away, why would he have followed Ash into the bathroom in the first place? It's almost like like he was hoping to catch him in private rather than Darby. I feel like a broken record at this point, but our best move from the moment we saw Jay in the van was to just sit down, shut up, and try to absorb as much information as possible for later on. I mean, for all we know, we stumbled into a full-blown creeper convoy out here, and now they're all going to take turns stabbing us to death like we just crossed the Rubicon. Darby heads out the front door to put their ill-conceived plan into action, but Lars doesn't take the bait right away. Seemingly forgetting about the armed kidnapper that could come after her at any second, she climbs back inside the van to check on Jay. However, upon removing the duct tape covering her mouth, the child makes a startling revelation. How many men were there? How many men? And Ash is on Team Snatcher. Awesome. If only we'd asked her that question before blindly trusting some dude we barely met. You know, like when we were completely alone with her 10 minutes ago. Realizing she's been had, Darby takes off into the nearby forest and loops back around to the women's room. But apparently, Ash spotted her before she could make a clean getaway. The sleeper agent cuts her off in the hallway just as she's about to rejoin Ed and Sandy, forcing her back into the women's room at gunpoint and demanding to see her phone. After deleting our failed message to the police, he finds the text from Darby's sister and asks if anyone's really expecting her at the hospital. For some reason, Darby decides to tell him all about her fueled family feud, and then the two engage in a little back and forth name calling, wherein she calls him out for abducting a child with a disease, which turns out to be something called Addison. If she gets too excited, she'll OD on the adrenaline. So your little intervention didn't do her any favor. Like, taping her up in the back of a van isn't gonna get her worked up. How stupid do you have to be to kidnap a kid that could drop dead under pressure? She won't be worth anything to you if she croaks on the road, and it's not like you can take her to the hospital during a flare-up. Just then, Sandy knocks on the door, asking if Darby's okay, prompting Ash to stow his piece down the front of his pants and go in for another diversionary kiss. Jesus, haven't either of these morons ever heard of a holster? While his hands are up selling that kiss, we could easily reach down and squeeze one off directly into his femoral artery before running a Mozambique on his ass for good measure. This time, we can tell the gun is charged by the forward position of the trigger, and even if it's on an empty chamber, we could still wrestle control of it away from the attacker and give Sandy an opportunity to either join the fight or call for backup. The concerned bystander asks if she can speak with Darby alone, which Ash calmly agrees to, but not before leaning in close to let her know he'll gun them all down if she lets the cat out of the bag. Once he's gone, Sandy subtly asks if everything's above board, but Darby just plays it off as a little boredom control. Smart move, staying tight-lipped on the situation. After all, we should probably assume Ash is listening through the door, ready to pop off the second we spill the beans. Still, we should have at least given her some kind of wink while gesturing with her hand in the shape of a gun. We could even mouth Lars while she's saying something in response to try and articulate the fact that they're working together. I know I said we shouldn't get the others involved as we can't know who they're with or how they'll handle this information, but things are rapidly spiraling out of control, and without a helping hand from Ed and Sandy, we're pretty much screwed no matter what. Besides, unless they're playing some serious 5D chess here, it's probably safe to assume the Honeymooners aren't in on the kidnapping scheme. The current situation is, in a way, yet another callback to The Thing. If they were all in on it, there's no reason they wouldn't attack us now and get it over with. After all, we've seen all of their faces. No way they just let us walk away. And since since we can't exactly raise the bat signal out here, we're gonna have to get rid of these jokers on our own. Fortunately, Ash left us alone in a construction site full of potential weapons. We should arm up with whatever we can find, preferably something like a framing hammer. And while we're at it, we should check and see if they've got any more of those nail guns lying around. Only, instead of trying to plink them to death from a distance, like Ash suggested, we'll wait until things get up close and personal, and use it as intended, lethal weapon style. Once we're prepared for battle, we should have Sandy tell Ash we want to speak with him again. Assuming he's dumb enough to take the bait, we can ambush him 
him at the door, ideally before he has time to draw his gun. Of course, if he doesn't fall for it, we'll have to play along a bit longer while we wait for an opportunity to stage a proper ambush. At that point, I'd look for something more concealable, like another box cutter to replace the one we left back in the van. Speaking of which, Jade's currently using it to cut herself free. However, the problem remains of where exactly she plans to go. Without proper winter clothing, she won't last long running through the forest, and the visitor center won't offer many hiding places once they start tearing the place apart. It probably wasn't a good decision to leave it out there. We could have made it better using the blade against Lars and Ash, and if Ed and Sandy saw little girl escaping from the back of the van, her kidnappers would have little choice but to open fire at that point. Fortunately, only Lars seems to spot Jay as she makes a break for freedom, causing him to get up and head outside without a word. Meanwhile, Darby gets up to head back to the ladies' room, with Ash following close behind. This is why we should have secretly clued Sandy in when we had her one-on-one, -on -one, as this would be the perfect opportunity for her to let Ed know what's going on. Instead, they're both left sitting on their hands, wondering why everyone else is acting so strange. Now, well, at least we got Ash separated from his partner in crime. Let's hope Darby has the nerve to capitalize on this. <laughs> what the hell was that? I mean, I'll give you points for trying, but your accuracy really took a sh on those follow-up swings. What, did you run out of stamina or something? Even if he's bobbing around too much to nail him in the head, you could have hit him just about anywhere else and still done some damage, especially if you flipped it around to the claw side. The good news is we're not hosed yet. The half-wit still has a loaded gun shoved down his pants, like he's about to rob a store. And right now, both his hands are currently wrapped around our neck. Once again, all we have to do is reach for his waistband and he'll be off urinals for good. Oh, or we could just slap at his face like he just pulled her pigtails, because that always works in these situations. Luckily for Darby, Lars shows up at the last second to report he's lost track of their little cash cow, giving them a reason to keep her alive, at least for now. The way Ash sees it, since Jay knows Darby's trying to help her, she might be able to lure her back to them. How However, before they can get to it, Jade sneaks away with the set of van keys Ash dropped during the struggle. Once outside, the men force Darby to call out to Jay, and apparently, they also thought it'd be a good idea to make her hold their only flashlight. Just as they start to lose their patience, Darby shines the beam directly in Ash's face before plunging straight down a nearby hill, narrowly avoiding being shot in the process. Her escape attempt proves mostly successful, although it comes at a steep cost. Good thing there were plenty of nice soft tree trunks around to break her fall. Normally, I'd say she should have tried laying a beat down on the gunman with her flashlight and going for the disarm, but given how that went last time, making a break for it was probably the better option. That said, it's a good thing they were stupid enough to entrust us with their sole source of light. Otherwise, we almost certainly would have caught a bullet while rolling down the hill. Back indoors, the sound of the gunshot draws Ed outside to investigate, alone, completely unarmed. There, he finds an unconscious Jay laying just outside the tree line and brings her back inside for Sandy to take a look at her. Fortunately, she happens to be a retired nurse, although something tells me Jay's condition is beyond a treatable with whatever they might have lying around the visitor center. Darby snaps back to reality in time to see Ed carrying Jay to safety. With her pursuers closing in around her, she hucks her flashlight off into the forest to draw them away while she makes a break for the main entrance. Might have been a good idea to hold on to that light in case we needed to head back outside at some point. We could have just as easily thrown a stick to achieve the same effect without costing ourselves a valuable resource. Once back inside, Darby finally blows the lid on Lars and Ash's kidnapping operation, all while standing with her back to the thin glass doors, separating her from the pair of armed men hunting her down. Yeah, cool story and all, but we might want to start locking this place down before the screaming starts. Once we shove something through the handles on the front door, we need to shut off all the interior lights so they can't see us moving around in there. At that point, they won't be able to get in without making a lot of noise, and since they went and gave their only flashlight away to the person working against them, it wouldn't be all that difficult to ambush them with whatever weaponry we can scrounge up from the construction site. By the way, we seem to have forgotten about the massive gaping hole in the wall they could use to sneak in. Better button that thing up as soon as possible, although it might be easier to just nail the door shut leading into the bathroom and call it good. Uh, well, apparently these two idiots forgot about it too, as they're just walking up to the front door like it's no big deal. Fortunately for us, it seems old Ed has a plan. You 
walk through that door, I will shoot you dead. Don't get too excited though. He's only bluffing, but at least for the moment, it's enough to keep these bozos on ice. However, as Sandy points out, time is not completely on our side. Jay's in dire straits, and if she doesn't receive proper medical attention soon, she's almost certainly a goner. This realization isn't lost on Bonnie and Clyde either, and apparently they have the exact medication she needs to stay alive. Using this fact, they try to broker a deal, give the girl up, and this whole thing disappears. Knowing Jay doesn't have much time, Sandy's all about this idea, but it's far too good to be true. We've all seen their faces and can provide a clear description of the van, if not also the plates from memory. These guys would have to be absolute idiots to think we wouldn't immediately rat them out to the cops the first chance we got, meaning no matter what we do, there's no way they're going to just pack up and leave. Better hope for a Christmas miracle, because right now our best chance of making it out of here alive is to keep the standoff going until the roads clear up. Either way, Ash and Lars aren't going anywhere without their keys, which Darby still has squirreled away from earlier. Thinking they've got an ace up their sleeve, gambling man Ed sends back a counteroffer. Cough up the medicine, and they can have their keys back. Unfortunately, the response isn't exactly what they hoped for. Watching from the window, they see the two men retrieve a gas can from the van, which they then proceed to dump out around the visitor center. As Ed points out, they'd have to be totally smooth-brained to burn us all alive with not only their meal tickets, but also their sole means of transportation. However, statistically speaking, most criminals are incredibly stupid. And thus far, these two men have proved to be no exception. Regardless, the Allstate man takes this for a bluff, and he's willing to bet the house on it. The way he sees it, it's only a matter of time before they give up the act and barge right in. So he decides to have Darby hide his keys and the van keys to eliminate any possibility of escape once they do. They can't kill us if they can't leave, right? Uh, wrong. They most certainly can kill you if they can't leave. Again, you're assuming these Nimrods think more than a single step ahead. Also, just as a rule, anytime you feel yourself thinking whatever you're up against can't kill you for whatever reason, go ahead and punch yourself right in the face. They can and will kill you. Just ask Nick and Angie from Await Further Instructions. Oh, wait, you can't. Because they both got their brains bashed in after assuming the threat couldn't actually kill them. I mean, they were both screwed anyways, but still. Not a good idea. Our only chance right now is to make sure that A, they don't light that match, and B, they stay outside. Sure, we could try and slip out through the hole in the bathroom, but then we'd only be trading burning to death or bleeding out with freezing into corpse sickles. Instead of stashing them somewhere, we should try and find some pliers or tin shears and threaten to destroy the keys outright and leave them completely stranded. This way, we can make it expressly clear what they'd be sacrificing if they don't back off. Besides, how does hiding them deter any anything. It's not like we'd be making it impossible for them to leave. They're just gonna hold us at gunpoint and be like, go get them. In the end, it doesn't matter, because Jay comes to just in time to recognize Sandy as her family's disgruntled housekeeper. That's right, it turns out, Sandy was the mastermind behind this kidnapping all along. Although, I can hardly blame her. This is my maid, Mrs. Lowry, and now she's gonna do the dance. Ready? Looks like TikTok strikes again. It turns out she started running this racket behind her husband's back after he wiped out their life savings with this crippling gambling addiction. Cause there's no way he could possibly pay it all away a second time, right? Anyway, she linked up with these two losers online, knowing Jay's parents could afford a multi-million dollar payout for her return. However, she never actually met them in person, so neither party actually knew what the other looked like. Not wanting to lose out on her share of the ransom, Sandy calls out to Ash and Lars, exposing Ed's gunplay for what it is. She then proceeds to mace Darby right in the face before dismantling the makeshift barricade and rolling out the red carpet for the kidnappers. With nothing holding them back, the goon squad strolls in and begins issuing commands, starting with having Sandy administer Jay's medication. Sure enough, the next order of business is asking Darby where she put the keys. Still thinking it'll make a difference, Ed warns her giving them up will be her last mistake, only to have his little MAD theory blown to pieces at 1,200 feet per second. You tell him that we're all dead. Oh, what was that about them not being able to kill you? Sorry, I can't hear you over the sound of your fatal gunshot wound. Desperate to avenge her fallen husband, Sandy charges in with the mace to dish out the spicy eyes. But before she can connect, Lars leaps out in front of the stream and soaks up enough to give Ash time to squeeze off a shot. Yeah, that's what you get for putting your trust in someone unhinged enough to kidnap a little girl. Even if you hadn't randomly stumbled into them out in the middle of nowhere, what leverage did you have to ensure they weren't going to screw you over out of your cut to 
begin with. Realistically, the moment you outed yourself as the inside maid, you pretty much signed your own death warrant. Down to their last loose end, Ash drags Darby over to the wall and forces her to stick around, while he takes Lars to wash his eyes out. Fortunately, they seem to have overlooked the claw hammer sitting nearby, only it's just barely out of reach. With her attackers indisposed, she calls Jay over for the assist, but before she can pry herself loose in the most painful way possible, Ash comes back to shake her down for the van keys. I'll give it to Ed. He was right about them not killing Darby until she forked over the keys. Too bad for him and Sandy, it only applies to the person that actually hid them. That said, they can still make what's left of our lives extremely unpleasant until we eventually crack. And it seems Ash knows just where to start. Your mom died. Damn, and by text, no less. Hard to say who did her dirtier, Ash or her sister. The messages don't stop there. Evidently, Darby's text to law enforcement made it through after all. Realizing this drastically limits their playtime, Ash cranks the pressure up to 11, threatening to hook Jay up with a mother of all piercings. Unfortunately for the kiddo's piano career, our best move right now would be to clam up and let Ash plug away. We already know he's not going to kill her, and since he needs us to access his getaway vehicle, all we have to do is hold out until the cops roll in. Seriously, it was pretty dumb for him to read that one out loud. Now we know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, as long as we have the stomach for it. Sure, we'll both probably wind up looking like Hellraiser by the time help arrives, but it beats being dead think. Ultimately, Darby's compassion gets the better of her, and she tells Ash she hid the keys in the snow just outside the bathroom. Not wasting any time, he leaves Lars with the Glock to watch over the prisoners, while he heads outside and gets to digging. If we just can't bear the sight of a small child getting tortured, we should have told Ash to cut us loose so we could show him exactly where we hid the goods. That way, we might at least have a chance to stage some kind of counter ambush and go for the disarm. Sure, it's a long shot, and it would probably end with us eating a slow but otherwise, pretty much only one of two things is going to happen. Either he'll find the keys and then come back to blow our brains out, or he won't find the keys, in which case he'll probably come back and beat us half to death. Of course, there might be a third possibility I haven't considered. Remember what I said about most criminals being incredibly stupid? Well, old Lars here would make the wet bandits look like D.B. Cooper. Realizing he wouldn't dare pull the trigger on their payday, Darby instructs Jay to go shut off the lights. Now, ordinarily, this wouldn't go anywhere, because because a grown man could easily just yeet the 60 pound child across the room and call it good, but not Lars. No, he's just gonna stand there hurling empty threats at her until she actually does it. As soon as the lights go out, Darby uses her special powers to snoof up the bag from Mikey's car like Popeye wolfing down a spinach. Meanwhile, Jay keeps Lars busy long enough for her to wrench herself free from the wall and bring the hammer down on his scrawny the ensuing struggle results in a negligent discharge, alerting Ash to the situation. But by the time he makes it back inside, Darby's already gained the upper hand. Well, I have to admit, I didn't think we were going to make it out of this one. Nothing to do now but pop these losers and wait for the cops to roll out the body bags. I mean, you are going to shoot him, right? Seriously, you have a clear shot at that pretty much anyone could make. For God's sake, take the shot. Oh, wait, that's right. We've got to do the whole put your gun down, no you thing for at least five minutes until something for forces one of us to act. Fortunately, Jay's far too young to understand this trope, and she comes in clutch with a framing hammer to knock Ash's shot astray with interesting results. What is this, a timeout? Just because Lars got happy Gilmore doesn't mean Ash isn't still an immediate threat. If you don't shoot him now, you're really gonna regret it in like five minutes when he's about to murder you again. Why bother to rid the world of the man who strangled you, shot at you, tortured you, and threatened to maim an innocent child? Better to just slowly sidle towards the Firebird and assume this shocking twist of fate has shown him the error of his ways. Speaking of which, you might want to sit Lars down before he slips on something and jams that framing nail three inches into his skull, like that. Now extra pit from the loss of his friend, Ash runs outside to settle the score, managing to shred the tires on Darby's getaway car with his magic nail gun and send them crashing headfirst into a flagpole. However, instead of delivering the coup de grace, he stops to go back and set fire to the visitor center, which conveniently takes just enough time for the lone police officer from earlier to show up and tragically misread the situation. Good news, Darby. We've got another slam dunk for you. Eventually, the cop is going to get close enough to see Ash's weapon and put this whole mess on 
act of self-protection. All we have to do now is sit still and shut up while we wait for nature to take its course. Nah, think of who we're talking about here. If she had that kind of clarity, we never would have gotten into this mess in the first place. Once again, danger-prone Darby decides to take matters into her own hands without a second thought, opening the driver's side door and dosing Ash in the shoulder before he can react. All right, you made your statement without getting lit up by the police. Time to quit while we're ahead and... <laughs> Screw it. Obviously, she's gonna stand straight up and present herself as an armed threat to the terrified cop who has absolutely no idea what's going on. And obviously, he's gonna shoot her and cause her to drop her gun. And now, this is gonna happen. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Never mind the fact Officer Carmine could clearly see him reaching for the weapon. What are you, playing on dial-up or something? Ash squares up on Darby to do what years of rampant abuse apparently never could. Only it seems he spent the last of his ammo smoking the uniform. After using the nail gun to finish off Johnny Law and scoring his service pistol, Ash leans in close to deliver one last round of bad guy dialogue within stabbing distance. And sure enough, Darby makes him pay for it. Really, you're not even gonna feed him a one-liner. You know, like, screw you, or dodge this, or get off my plane. What a shame. Oh well, what's done is done, and with no one left to stop her, Darby drags herself beside the fallen officer and uses his radio to call for help, finally bringing an end to this nightmare once and for all. In the end, only Darby and Jay made it out alive. However, we could have easily coordinated police rescue without ever having forced a confrontation with the kidnappers, thereby sparing Ed, Sandy, and the cop, and possibly even Lars and as long as they didn't go pulling in North Hollywood. That said, even after the cat was out of the bag, we still had ample opportunity to flatline both of them. And for that reason, I think no exit was beat. Moral of the story, sometimes no action is the best action. Do you have four of the latest Gamersup's waifu cups and need one more for a reason you will and should take to your grave? Well, Kaho Shibuya's Creator Cup pre-order just dropped. Pre-order one before it's too late to properly contain your GG liquids. Use my my code unbeaten to get 10% off anything else.